Ladies and gentlemen, this is Robin Niblett, uh, the director of Chatham House. As you may know, we've got a, a big event this evening. I see a few more people joining, but uh, over 300 participants uh, on this call. So I'm simply going to say welcome to all of you. We're now uh, going live, um, and it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Philip Hammond uh, with us uh, today. Philip will be uh, speaking with us in a minute, obviously known to everyone here. Uh, having served as Chancellor of the Exchequer from 2016 to 2019 for three years through a, a turbulent time, both on the global economy, but also for uh, the UK itself as well. Um, but somebody who's also held two of the other important and great offices of state um, as Secretary of Defense and Foreign Secretary, um, as well as Secretary of Transport. So we could take him in any sort of direction uh, on how the UK is coping with this uh, crisis. But um, as the title indicated, this is about the global economy after COVID-19 as an opening standpoint. So in a minute, I will turn to Philip Hammond and uh, we'll get a few remarks from him. I am going to turn to a couple of guests who I thought it would be good to get a sort of brief response from and just engage a bit in the conversation. Uh, Sir John Simmons, uh, John Simmons, who is now the chairman of GSK, uh, formerly deputy chairman of HSBC, um, but also somebody who both through his GSK line and also through his work on the Genome Project, is somebody who knows the health situation particularly well. Uh, wrote an interesting private paper with Jitesh recently on how to come out of the uh, lockdown. Um, thrilled he's with us. And also Dame Diane Julius, who uh, used to be chairman of Chatham House. Um, she was a founding member of the Monetary Policy Committee uh, and also is now a distinguished fellow uh, at Chatham House, has been on various boards and chief economist of various companies, but I thought getting a couple of their viewpoints in before we engage in all the Q&A would be great. And uh, the last point I'll make after we've had those conversations, there is a hands up function, a uh, little difficult to use with 300 of, 340 of you on this call, but uh, that may give us an option for a slightly more interactive format later on, rather than just going through the Q&A. So last point, this is obviously on the record, um, not under the Chatham House rule, um, it is being live streamed. You can tweet away, hashtag CH events. Um, but let me turn right now to Philip Hammond. Philip, thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure you've been doing quite a few of these uh, Zoom meetings in recent uh, weeks, um, but we're really thrilled you would join us at this pivotal moment where the UK and other key economies are making that move or trying to work out how they make that move from lockdown to recovery. And I think this note of after COVID-19 in our title is probably some of the issues we want to get to. But um, obviously you bring great experience on the international stage as Chancellor, having participated in G20, IMF, all of these meetings. We really look forward to your remarks uh, and thank you for joining us. Over to you. Well, Robin, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure um, to be here. And um, thank you for inviting me to make some um, opening remarks. Um, I think the most important thing is to start by acknowledging that this is primarily a health crisis and it's right that it's been treated as primarily a health crisis. But it is also very important that we are not intimidated uh, into silence on the economic implications and consequences of this health crisis. Public opinion on this issue has been uh, very clear, at least in the UK, that it supports the uh, primary health focus that the government has applied. Um, but as Lord Lamont uh, commented, I think uh, this morning, um, it almost feels as though the public has been anaesthetized to the economic consequences by the very significant interventions that government here and indeed around the world have made. And the public does need to know that those interventions can only be short term. Uh, and, and therefore, however they may feel today, there will come a point, and it probably won't be too far away, where they start to be concerned as well about the economic implications. So it is right that we're um, having uh, this debate. And of course, we have it in the context of a global economy that was already facing some pretty significant headwinds before this crisis started. The title, Global Economy Post-COVID, is in itself slightly provocative. In, in a way, this will be a high class problem for us to be dealing with. How to restart the global economy after we are sure that the COVID virus is conquered, that we have um, a vaccine, that we have treatments uh, available. Um, 
it will it will not be without its challenges but it will be much easier than the alternative planning scenario which is the one that i think we have to focus on um, because we should always focus on the worst realistic case outcome and that is that we have to restart the economy in an environment where we don't yet know whether we will find a vaccine that's effective we don't yet know whether we will find treatments or indeed cures for uh, the disease that means that the one at least potential scenario is a new normal a new reality where business has to operate the economy has to be reactivated because we can't leave it shut down forever but in a world where covid has not been conquered that will mean businesses developing new models it will mean us being prepared to operate in probably a much more highly regulated environment uh, it will mean new ways of doing things new ways of living our lives even if we don't uh, even if we are fortunate in being able to return to business as usual we will have to deal with the scarring effects of this shutdown uh, on the economy uh, the um, failure of some businesses the loss of jobs the erosion of fiscal capacity through the interventions that governments have made structural challenges which will affect different sectors of the economy um, in different ways the acceleration perhaps of some trends we've already seen like the decline of the high streets very difficult for me to imagine that all the retailers that have closed because of the virus will reopen um, after it uh, and perhaps some changes of priorities it's not clear yet but um, i wouldn't want to guarantee that the same focus will be placed on the climate change agenda by all actors after this crisis as was um, before so some um, some big structural changes as well as the scarring effects that we have to deal with um, meanwhile i think we have to remind ourselves that for most of us this virus is a big story as opposed to some of the relatively recent um, new viruses that have affected the world because it has particularly struck um, in the developed uh, economies and uh, we shouldn't forget that the kind of challenges that we're seeing in europe in north america um, from this virus um, may look relatively benign as the virus sweeps across sub-Saharan Africa, areas of the world where health, health uh, facilities are, are significantly less developed and where in fact in sub-Saharan Africa also large parts of the population are already immunocompromised and potentially more vulnerable to uh, the consequences of the virus. This will be a huge challenge for the global system and if we get it wrong, um, is likely to have long-term uh, impacts like um, continued very strong migratory uh, pressures. Trade is another area that is going to be hugely challenged by uh, the consequent, the immediate consequences of the virus. We've already seen, I think, exposed the lack of resilience in supply chains and many people, businesses, governments, international regulators will be thinking about the trade-off the balance between um, resilience and efficiency in supply chains and how we deal with that um, as we resume global trade we're going to have to be very careful that um, we don't see uh, an, an orgy of protectionism and uncontrolled state aid leading to an acceleration of the already strong trade tensions that we saw before the crisis. And then uh, my final sort of international point is that there's an uncomfortable underlying uh, reality here around demographics. You can't get away from the fact um, that the older um, part of the population, which is generally the part of the population that is well cushioned by assets and wealth, um, has less of an interest perhaps in the early restarting of the economy and more of an interest uh, in uh, focusing on the health risks. The, the younger part of the population may well see 
the priorities in a different light. And in a world, certainly in, in developed economies, where there's already a pretty strong sense um, that the balance has tipped unfairly uh, across the demographic spectrum, um, this is one more straw. I won't say it's the straw, but it's one more straw on this potential, on this camel's back. We're also going to have to have a debate in the longer run about who pays for all of this. Is it going to be higher taxes? Is it going to be another squeeze on public services? Is it going to be more borrowing, uh, which means um, asking the next generation uh, to pay the cost? Is it going to be um, another period when public authorities reach for or at least tolerate inflation as a way of uh, dealing with the debts that have been run up? I think these are all very big challenges for the global system. And uh, if I might say, really, we have to try and avoid our politicians across the world reducing this to, a, to apparently simplistic trade-offs. It isn't about jobs versus lives. And anyone who dares to talk about the economic consequence is callous and heartless. It isn't about liberty versus lives. Um, but we will have to have a debate about how much of our freedoms, um, data privacy, we're prepared to surrender in order to support technological solutions to managing the virus. And I think uh, across the world, there is a desperate need for leadership, for a strategic approach uh, to this challenge, for people who can look beyond the immediate crisis, several moves ahead and map out um, the route out of the crisis and uh, a future uh, for the world. And if I can bring that back to the UK for a moment, I of course understand the government's focus on the immediate health priorities and I very much support the measures the gov government has taken. I support the turn on the taps uh, response that the government has taken in terms of fiscal and monetary um, response. And of course the whole purpose I hope many people will now be able to see this that perhaps didn't see it before, but the whole purpose of the fiscal consolidation process after 2009 was to ensure that we had some headroom and some capacity to respond to the next crisis when it arrived and whatever form it took. And no one would have guessed that it was coming in 2020 or that it was going to take this form. But I do think that the government now needs visibly to be looking two or three moves ahead, to be turning its attention to engagement with the business community about the recovery phase, even though it's clear that restrictions will have to remain for now and may have to remain for some time to come. That doesn't, that doesn't exclude uh, a restarting process for the economy. Business confidence is very fragile and businesses need to see that there is light at the end of the tunnel, and that that uh, light is best presented to them as the government engaging with them, setting some planning assumptions, mapping out some scenarios to allow businesses to plan, including for the scenario where business models have to change significantly in order to accommodate a world where we're living with restrictions and regulations, perhaps for a long time to come. It's vital that business is ready for the green light when the government decides to signal it. And um, uh, we don't know whether there's going to be a vaccine or a cure. We don't know whether we're going to have to reopen uh, with the virus still in place. Um, but how we manage that um, gradual reopening and how prepared business is for it um, will determine how quickly uh, we can respond. So we need that um, route map. This is a two trillion pound economy. You can't spin it up overnight from nothing. And um, we owe it to businesses, we owe it to all our citizens to make sure that when the green light is signalled, business can respond very quickly. And that means um, being prepared because the quicker we do it, the fewer businesses will fail and the fewer jobs um, will be lost. And the final point I'd make for our own politicians, our own government is this, however much today the opinion polls are telling us, um, our common sense is telling us 
that people are primarily focused on the health situation. There will come a point in the evolution of this crisis where the focus switches. Uh, once it's clear that we are managing the health situation, people will start to then worry about their jobs, their living standards, their children's futures, and they will expect their governments to be ready to respond to that phase of the crisis as effectively as they responded to the acute um, health phase of the crisis. So I think, Robin, if I could just conclude um, these remarks by saying, um, I'm afraid I am, uh, I think that those who are forecasting a, a V-shaped recovery are probably erring on the side of optimism. Um, I suspect that it is more likely that it will be something of a U-shaped recovery. But there is no doubt in my mind that how steep the recovery slope is will depend on how well prepared business is to respond when the government gives the signal and how soon the government is able uh, to give that signal. Once that happens, across the world, there'll be a huge challenge for the international community in coordinating the recovery phase, ensuring that it doesn't give rise to new explosive tensions around trade, state aid, unfair competition um, issues. And uh, there is no doubt that this, um, this episode, this crisis, will have a huge influence on the global trade debate that was already going on. Uh, it will be a big shaper uh, of the debate about the benefits of technology and the um, challenge of maintaining data privacy. Um, it will potentially be a pendulum swing moment in the big versus small government uh, debate. Government is clearly going to be um, playing a very large role in our economy through 2020. The question is whether it um, shrinks back uh, to normal size quickly thereafter. Um, I think, if I may, just three final points. Um, combined with uh, the uh, narrative we already have about automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, learning etc., um, some of the um, uh, challenges that this crisis has presented, I think, may cause us to reorder our sense of the global hierarchy of labour, which roles are the most important, the most well remunerated, the most highly regarded. Um, in our society. It could also determine the outcome of the US election, of course. And to the extent that it does, uh, it could be a determining factor in how several of these important global debates play out over the coming years. And finally, it may, I say no more than that, it may uh, turn out to be a determining factor in the future trajectory of the European Union and the Eurozone in particular, which I think is under some uh, stress as a result of the way uh, the crisis has been handled. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for those remarks. You covered the waterfront, um, as I would expect, and very well raised a lot of important questions. And, um, you know, I thought some relatively strongly made points at the beginning, the comment about uh, that people shouldn't be uh, intimidated into silence on talking about the economic dimensions of this crisis, even though, as you said, it is a health crisis in its current format, um, and that the public may have been sort of anesthetized for the moment, but when they wake up, back to the points you were making at the end, they will wake up with concerns about jobs, their children's future, etc. So a government is going to have to make a very complex pivot. Before I turn to uh, John Simmons and Deanne Julius for maybe some one or two comments on your remarks, um, there was just, let me just pull in one question. I just keep it very specific for the moment because then we can go big uh, into some of the global issues. But uh, Aubrey Allegretti from Sky News asked this question, how long do you think the Treasury in a way can keep up this uh, do whatever it takes uh, type of funding? Uh, we went into this luckily with the deficit now, what, a little under 3%, 2% heading very much in the right direction. But projections of it potentially exploding uh, to a level higher than it was under the global financial crisis, above 10%, potentially by the end of the year. Um, if you were in the, in, in the Treasury, I mean, how does one gauge 
how long, I mean, how much is in the tank and how credible what is in the tank is. Can you just say a quick word about that? Yeah, I think it's a very different situation from 2009. In, in 2009, we had to recapitalize uh, financial institutions. What we're talking about here is essentially um, liquidity support to the economy. The big challenge for the government, and, and, the, and the government can keep doing that for a, a short to medium period of time. Of course, it, it um, eventually has to be repaid, um, but the government is right to try to prevent long-term damage to the economy. But on the other side of the equation, um, we our economy will be different after this crisis, and there will need to be restructuring, and the government will have to be prepared to tell people that the high levels of support that are currently being provided cannot be provided forever, and they cannot prevent an essential restructuring as businesses that have become non-viable um, have to fail, and jobs that have become non-viable have to go. And that, that point will come. And I think um, it's, it's probably more of a political challenge than a fiscal challenge, because we can't keep the economy shut for um, long periods of time. And in the short term, um, what the government's doing is perfectly um, sustainable and manageable, although we shouldn't delude ourselves um, that it will have a consequence in the longer term, there will be less fiscal capacity available for some of those um, laudable uh, objectives that this government set out. Was it really only five or six weeks ago in a budget? And just uh, to another of course, short term direct question. Sorry, I didn't have time to write down who this one came from, but it was uh, for an important question. How ready do you think uh, uh, British households are, and one could maybe apply this across many Western countries for this crisis. You know, we've got used to an era of low unemployment, but that low unemployment's been combined, it looks like, certainly looking to the United States, to a certain extent to the UK, with people with very low savings, uh, living in a slightly just-in-time financial situation, which was fine so long as the economy was floating forward, um, but debt, personal debt was starting to build up again. How worried are you that in a way households uh, are vulnerable going into this crisis, even if you said it's very different from 2008? Um, I think we should be very worried about that. There is a, a, a significant lack of resilience um, in the household sector. Um, I can't remember the exact figures, but something like 50% of households have less than a thousand pounds of savings. Um, and, and so uh, unavoidably, when a crisis like this ar arrives, um, households look immediately to the government uh, and expect a very comprehensive social safety net. Now, that is fine, and that's um, broadly in line with what's been provided across Europe. But if I may, I would just make the point that it's quite a long way away from the sort of image of a newly resurgent Britain striding the global stage, taking on the Asians and the Americans in head-to-head uh, -head competition. When the chips are down, um, the instinct of British politicians and I suspect the British public is very much in what I would call the European welfare statist mainstream to look to the government uh, to step in and protect them. And I'm just going to um, let my colleagues know that I want to bring John Simmons in in a second, but just so they have a chance to get that ready. Um, just one uh, more question, David Walker. Uh, asked the question about, you know, Christine Lagarde has talked that it might take 10 years um, for folks to recover, for the global economy to recover in a real way. Um, are you worried that this is going to have, you talked about scarring, which is a phrase that's been used quite a bit recently, that it could have that kind of a long-term effect? I'm sure we'll get into this more in a minute, but could you just say a word about that quickly? So if we are able to develop an effective vaccine or a treatment so that we can put this behind us, I would expect um, the global economy to, uh, and, and if we avoid um, spiraling into a sort of um, trade war death spiral, um, then I would expect the global economy to recover more quickly from this crisis than it did from the financial crisis. But if we don't find a, a vaccine um, or, or a cure, and we have to adapt the global economy to living with COVID, then I, I think it's far too early to say um, what the longer term impacts of that may be, because we don't know yet how um, dampening of economic activity and growth 
the necessary restrictions would be. That sounds like a, a perfect segue, if I may say, Philip, to, uh, to John Simmons. John, welcome to uh, this call. Thanks for joining us. And I think having somebody uh, who brings both a, a business and a, a medical background, in a way, you're sitting on the two sides of that balancing act that Philip Hammond's been describing, um, that uh, politicians and the economy as a whole is going to manage. Uh, and I thought it was very interesting what Philip said at the end there. It really depends what we're going to have to live with. The economy should be able to bounce out relatively quickly, but it depends so much on how we manage, uh, how we're able to manage the long-term effects of this particular virus. Um, why, why don't you share just a couple of thoughts, maybe things you picked up from Phil Hammond's comments on one or two you might want to make yourself. If I do this, it means um, we're coming to the end of your intervention. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Robin. And uh... Philip, thank you for raising what I think are really very big questions. And I think it's important that, that they are recognized as big questions. This is not a, an issue that is trivial in any sense at all. And it will, it will have foundational consequences. And I don't think modeling is going to resolve the question. These will be hard, hard judgments to take. I think where I am optimistic, there will be a vaccine. Um, it was um, the genome of the, uh, of the virus was sequenced very quickly and the world has been working on vaccines for some time. I have, my 30 years in the industry have never seen such a collaborative approach being taken. GSK has seven collaborations across the world. We're sharing all of our expertise, all of our technology. But I think, I think the point you finish with that we will be living with COVID is the right one. It'll be 12 to 18 months before there is a, a vaccine and maybe longer before it's available at scale. And therefore there is no sequential resolution of the health issue before you move to the economic issue. They are intertwined and as a result, uh, judgments are gonna be, have to be taken. And I think the point that you raise about um, an open collaborative dialogue is really important. I don't think politicians or businesses can resolve this without agreeing together what the appropriate risk-based steps are. We will get some steps wrong. We'll move too quickly in some areas and too slowly in others. And it has to be a, it has to be a debate that people are engaged on. Firstly, I think in terms of the demographics that you raise. We will increasingly understand who are at risk and who are invulnerable, and we can increasingly protect that part of the population. The more protected they are, the more confidently other people can go about business uh, in, the, in the new normal. Um, and I think, um, you know, we also need to understand that to be able to allocate what will be scarce vaccines. Um, and so there will be a complex arbitration, arbitration process. I think the economy, as you say, will be different. And I think we need to embrace that today and recognize how we compete, how we perform, how we succeed in a, in a, in an economy that is not as open uh, as it was before, because you know we will live with this. It is not gonna go away and we will have to make economic decisions uh, in the absence of, of, of hard, hard insight. Perhaps I'll leave it there, Robin. Thanks very much um, for those comments, John. And I think this point you made right at the beginning that even if there is a vaccine, we're going to be living with probably COVID-19 or its successors or whatever in some way. So there is no pure going back to business as usual in this space, never mind all the other many areas in which life has been disrupted, which Philip Hammond uh, uh, referred to. Philip, did you want to come back quickly on any of those points? And then I'm going to turn to Deanne Julius, but I give you the option if you wanted to come back on one point quickly. No, I think I agree with uh, everything John has uh, said there. Um, uh, let's hear what Deanne's got to say. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, indeed, uh, Deanne, also for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you on this call. Um, and um, I'm sure you'll be bringing a somewhat of international perspective, as you've always, as you've always done for us at Chatham House. But I'll let you jump in on the back of any of 
bit of Pamela's comments that you wanted to pick up or any particular insight you wanted to share here with the group. Well, thanks very much, Robin. And thank you, Philip, for a really thought provoking uh, view on what the world economy may look like and the, the problems we're going to be facing in the future. I think I was particularly struck by the fact that you took a very, uh, what I would consider negative scenario. Uh, now, maybe that's because it is always better to uh, hope for the best and plan for the worst, as they say. But I, I do think that there's some danger in spending too much time thinking about the really negative scenario if the probabilities uh, are not very high. Of course, we economists can't really estimate those probabilities. It's up to the epidemiologists, I'm afraid, and John's people to, uh, to let us know just uh, how optimistic or not we should be on the health aspects. Uh, but certainly, I too spent some time in the, in the pharmaceutical industry uh, on, on the board of Roche, the, the Swiss company, and I was continually struck by just how creative and brilliant many of those scientists are, with so many of them working on it, with all of the relevant experience in other types of treatments, which may or may not work for this particular virus. I, I think there's a, a pretty good chance that we'll be making some progress on the, on the medical front sooner rather than later. Having said that though, I think it is important to think about uh, a downside. I don't believe that it's particularly useful for government to provide the base case that business uses. Now, maybe this comes from um, my time in, in the oil industry at Shell, where we always use scenarios, but I do think this is a classic scenario case. There really are at least two ways this could develop and probably a few in the middle. Uh, it could be that we're 18 months, two years away from uh, a vaccine and nothing will come up in, in the meantime through uh, experience from other countries and how they exit their lockdowns to help us. But I think it's, uh, it, it's also uh, reasonably likely that uh, we're in the pit, in the trough of the, uh, of the problem right now, uh, that some of the fiscal measures that have come into place will indeed cushion the effects on households and indeed even the effects on businesses. I think many of them are well engaged, as, as I'm sure you all know, are well engaged in their own scenario thinking. Uh, the, there are a few um, I guess you'd say uh, silver linings to this very dark cloud. Everybody has had a crash course in how to use IT for businesses. Uh, for uh, I don't know when Chatham House will be reopening, but I hope it'll continue doing this sort of thing because it's actually quite easy for us not to have to commute uh, into that part of central London, even uh, especially when the traffic comes back. Uh, but uh, these are efficiency gains, uh, and I think. Uh, there are some benefits in uh, a little more homeworking and a little less business travel if one can do it uh, over, the, over the IT systems. Uh, I know one company I'm involved with in the, in the commercial office space is thinking very hard about whether we're all going to need such a large office space in the future. So there's plenty of scenario planning about business models at least going on right now. And I think that what is necessary for business is indeed real transparency and, and data, not just from our government, but from governments in, in, in other countries, so that they can have, uh, have very good uh, in, information on which to base their scenarios. I guess I just finished, because I see Robin waving at me, uh, by saying I think there is certainly a role for government, though, and part of it is uh, bolstering some of the international cooperative areas that are there, uh, whether it's trade, or the World Health Organization, which the Americans have apparently abandoned as, as part of the solution, but I think it certainly must be part of the solution for this crisis. Uh, and, and those are the things which I think on the international front, governments can really help with. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you. It was, it was a gentle wave. It was just a little, you know, <laughs> but thank you very much indeed. I'm just conscious I'm keeping an eye on time here, but we've got a good 25 minutes to be able to uh, continue. But yeah, thank you very much for those remarks and for pointing out this kind of balance, as you said, we hopefully don't need to be uh, too pessimistic. And there may even be, as you said, efficiency gains and ways of not going back to business as usual that over time will become uh, beneficial. Philip, if I can come back to you with and use uh, Deanne's comments there, and I'll let you come back if you have some points you want to, um, to come back to her on her remarks. But there was a question right at the beginning, which was pretty much at the top of the list uh, when it started, about whether 
um, we've almost moved into a form of universal basic income. Um, we've been tipped into it by the way this crisis has panned out. Uh, with all the fears that were emerging about automation knocking jobs out, and as Diane was saying, we've made a, now a rapid move an acceleration in a way into a technologically different type of way of, of working. I mean, where do you sit on the whole universal basic income concept? It's a bit of a catch-all phrase and you probably yeah. want to unpick it. Well, look, I'm, I'm, I, I am skeptical. I understand the superficial attraction, um, but I, when, when um, I, I, I've always been wary of a world in which government takes more away from people in order to give it back to them uh, and involves itself in the um, recirculation of um, uh, resource. Obviously, government has a role to play in redistribution, um, but I am very sceptical about um, structures which involve the government taking money from people in the middle income bracket in order simply to give it back um, to the same people. Um, so I, 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 there's no doubt in my mind that this will give uh, a boost to those who are arguing uh, for something along these lines, but I'm, I'm, I'm gently skeptical myself. I would just like to make two, two points about the, the comments that um, Diane made, um, because I, I wasn't, uh, um, I don't think it's my role to paint a negative scenario. Um, I, I'm simply noting that scientists are telling us that we should not assume um, that a virus, uh, that a vaccine uh, will be discovered that is effective. And even if it is, it may be some time away. And the reason that I um, consider that we should start scenario planning for a world in which we have to live with the virus without a vaccine is that if we take the opposite view, that there will be an effective vaccine and then everything will be all right, I'm afraid we're going to play right into the hands of those who would wish to suggest that the economy remains locked down uh, broadly along current lines until such time as we have the belt and braces of a widely available effective vaccine. I don't think we can afford to do that. I think we've got to start reopening the economy. And I think the sensible compromise is to reopen around um, a set of conditions which, which assume that at least for the time being, we are coexisting with this virus rather than conquering it. And Diane also raised the question of whether the government should provide the sort of base case scenario. I completely agree with her that um, business is quite good at working out these scenarios for itself. But the bit that government will have to um, offer up is the likely regulatory environment, because um, governments around the world will have views about how much control they want to retain over the economy, um, over the um, health situation, um, uh, and how much they want to restrict the freedom of businesses. Um, but I just finished by, by making one further point. Um, government is part of this but we are another part of it. Uh, and I suspect in the end, businesses will find that they will be more affected by changed behaviors of it than they will by regulatory impositions from government. Diane talked about maybe a little less business travel. Well, that's fine. But if you're a, um, you know, a, a hotel operator or an airline, um, a little less business travel um, could be the, the, the marginal blow that um, tips you over the edge. And of course, uh, people in uh, commercial real estate already reeling from what is undoubtedly another blow to retail, um, uh, to retail real estate um, will now be thinking, will now be asking themselves whether the functioning of the technology in this crisis means that this really will be the time when we change our behaviours. We've said many times before, um, this will change people's working patterns forever, and it hasn't, but perhaps this time it will. I certainly, personally, um, having been forced to master the technology of the video conference, um, will be much less likely to get on a plane or a train um, to go somewhere than I will be to dial people up on a video conference.
Thank you very much for those comments. So we've got a lot of questions coming in, um, and a lot of them are quite international and take advantage, Philip, not just of your kind of chancellor role, but also your foreign affairs and, and, and defense role. So before I'm going to kind of pivot to that in, in two minutes or so, we can let, try and leave the last 15 minutes to go into, into foreign policy in a big way. But I thought it was a very important question that came up. Maybe this is an unfair question to give it to you, but you're here, so I'll give it to you in any case. Um, if you had to sort of weigh up the risks of heading towards an inflationary spiral in the future, a deflationary spiral, or even stagflation, um, you know, so much money being pumped into the economy. If there is a quick recovery of some sort, it could knock itself over, or a lot of money going in, but not enough supply picking up in the economy, you could lead to stagflation. I mean, have you thought this through a little bit? And if you had to sort of share with, with our members here where you'd put your biggest uh, worry um, in that nasty trio, uh, do you have one you'd have at the top of the list? Well, in the short term, um, I, I would worry a little bit about um, inflationary pressures. We're certainly in the UK, we're largely supporting um, household incomes, and yet um, household consumption um, will have fallen quite sharply as there are all sorts of things that people can't spend their, uh, can't spend their money on. And as you say, there's been a very significant monetary and uh, fiscal stimulus to the economy. Um, but in the long run, I guess, um, since we're facing the demographic challenge that we are across the developed world, um, you, you, one might say that that um, inflationary stimulus um, may be a welcome counter to what overall um, will be quite a strong deflationary pressure from um, the demographic profile that we're facing across the advanced uh, economy world. Let me take you, Philip, into a couple of the, uh, the more foreign policy type questions. You won't be surprised uh, by this pivot. We've had at least two questions and, and a high ranking for the China question, which is, you know, grabbing every, as it was even prior to COVID, there was that sense that there was a, a real shift in public and political opinion in response to the more centralizing, more authoritarian uh, uh, instincts and actions uh, undertaken by the Chinese government. Um, there's a question actually from the Sydney Morning Herald, which I think tells you kind of reach one can achieve right now through these types of uh, meetings. Uh, quoting Dominic Raab is saying last week that business can't go on as usual with China after the pandemic. Um, that's a big phrase. The question is, what might it mean? There's been some pretty uh, firm language coming from the Foreign Affairs uh, Select Committee, obviously from the United States and, uh, and President Trump and many people around him on a bipartisan basis as well on the Democratic side. When you look at the China question, if I may put it in that big way, um, is, could this be a really important big pivot or not? Uh, let me just start with that. What's your sense? Well, I think it's another factor in what is becoming a very difficult um, question for countries like the UK. Um, I mean, all European countries find themselves uh, increasingly squeezed between the two great power blocks. They, you know, we have, we have three big economic powers in the world, US, European Union, uh, and China, and two strategic powers, the US and China. And, and Europe, with a large uh, economy, large developed economy, but really absolutely no strategic power at all to defend those economic interests, has found itself squeezed and is likely to continue to find itself um, squeezed. Um, and my view has always been that the, to, from the UK's point of view, um, as a medium-sized, very open trading economy, we simply can't allow ourselves to be forced to choose between having a trading relationship with the world's largest economy and a trading relationship with the world's second largest economy. We've clearly got to have um, pragmatic business relationships um, with both. Now, I think what we're seeing here um, is not, not an event, but a, uh, a trend of an increasing awareness of the challenge to the established global norms that China's um, rising importance means. China is a very different country from the UK or the US. We run our affairs in a very different way. There's a very different relationship between the state and the individual. And uh, it is natural that we are wary 
of a country with such very different history, um, cultural and social and political norms as ours from becoming a bigger and bigger voice in world affairs. But I've always taken the view that we have two choices. We either work to engage the Chinese and try to accommodate their legitimate demands for a role in the global system, and we contain China's emergence within the infrastructure of the global economy and political system, or we rebuff China and invite China to use its economic and increasingly strategic muscle to develop a system of its own, which would be in contradistinction to the existing global order. My personal view is to favor the former approach uh, unless and until um, it proves impossible to deliver. Do you think, just picking very specifically on this, this changes the political calculus, including for governments, whatever they may think would be the right approach, but the pressure is becoming very strong. Um, uh, having such dependence on China in supply chains, which again has been reminded here in the US figures of over 90% of pharmaceuticals being made in China, um, obviously huge dependence uh, being shown on PPE type equipment and so on. This quickly tips over into Huawei type space and into the yes, issue of uh, infrastructure and technology. So even if you have the question of, 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 um, of whether it's a security risk, which the British security services seem to have concluded at least a majority opinion is not, you end up with a supply risk and a dependence risk. And I've heard the case made very strongly that one has to reduce dependence without obviously shutting off the thing entirely. What do you think about that pivot? Well, I, I agree with that. And I think that um, one of the lessons we're going to learn from uh, this crisis, and it could have come from a different type of crisis, it could have come from a shutdown of global transportation for some reason, um, is that um, highly efficient supply chains lack resilience almost by definition. But in, business, in a business as usual world, highly efficient supply chains represent a competitive advantage. So if we are going to mandate greater resilience, less efficiency, we really have to find some kind of international framework within which to do that. And there are different ways in which we can improve resilience. It might be reshoring of uh, manufacturing through automation. I think quite a lot of that is likely to happen anyway in an economy where labor cost uh, becomes less important and um, carbon footprint becomes more important it will make sense that um, some parts of the economy are going to go back to what has been the norm for hundreds of years, that things are made close to the final uh, consumers. Um, but we might also look to the source of the problem. We might say to the Chinese, very frankly, we are not comfortable with the level of exposure we have um, to these um, China-dominated supply chains. What are you going to do about it? One, one option is for the producer to commit to holding much, much larger buffer stocks of important items um, close to the markets that they serve. Um, uh, so there, there may be more than one way of approaching this problem, but I don't think we should be shy uh, in, in setting out what the problem is, but we also have to do it eyes wide open knowing that there will be lots of protectionists and ne'er-do-wells um, trying to sneak in under cover of this debate about supply chains um, to roll back globalization in a way that is damaging and unhelpful. So let me, I'm going to do an awkward swerve here, but I just want to make sure we don't end up with uh, not enough time to address this question properly. But again, one of the top questions uh, on our list here was what um, the whole COVID crisis might mean for the pace of Brexit. Um, Brexit has happened and since the UK has already left the EU, it is no longer a member, but we have a deadline coming up at the end of June, if I remember rightly, it's already gone into pre-COVID mist slightly in my mind, um, uh, where the government has to have decided by then whether it wishes to ask for an extension at the end of the year or not. Um, What's your sense on this? Because obviously we've got, as you said, you're trying to provide predictability at the beginning to business. Um, here's a second element of, un of uh, unpredictability, or maybe it is to give predictability, to say we stick with the end of the year, at least business knows where it stands. What do you think the probabilities are and what would your advice be? 
Well, um, first, first of all, uh, it's obviously um, very much in everyone's interest that we reach uh, an agreement with the European Union to enable tariff-free, quota-free trade uh, to continue between the UK and the EU. That becomes a much, it was always difficult in the time scale. It becomes much more difficult because of these um, circumstances. My, my, um, my own view is that um, the, economy, the UK economy and the whole European economy has taken a significant shock. Um, I, I think it would be unwise to contemplate imposing on the UK economy a second potential shock um, within a short period of time that would leave us at a competitive disadvantage, comparative disadvantage with our um, uh, trading partners and neighbours. That said, the government has been very clear from the outset that it did not want to extend the transition period. Um, I think this is not an entirely black and white situation. I can envisage that it might be possible, for example, to agree with the European Union uh, in a sort of quick and dirty manner over the next couple of months, an interim trade arrangement, which is not the transition period, ends the transition, um, sets up uh, an arrangement that will protect um, tariff and quota free trade on a temporary basis between the UK and the EU, recognising that that arrangement will have features that perhaps for both sides would not be acceptable or attractive in the long term, but at least gives us a breathing space to get over this crisis and to have some proper discussions about the long term arrangements between the UK and the EU. Let me again just jump around some of the other questions uh, that I've seen noted here. Quite a few questions about the future of the EU. And just to use again your experience in particular in the Treasury, but also in uh, the Foreign Office. Um, uh, very difficult for the EU to weave its way through uh, what have been a series of national responses, principally given the responsibility of uh, nation states and governments for health provision. But a kind of collapse of the Schengen Agreement uh, refusal to agree corona bonds, as they're rather unpleasantly uh, described, but nonetheless, in true EU style, some muddling through uh, on greater financial uh, means through the ECB and, and the European monetary system. In any case, that's enough set up. Where would you sit? Is this an existential moment for the EU? Um, because that matters for the UK as well. But or do you think this is, you've seen this script before and the EU kind of muddles its way through. Mm. Where do you sit on that balance? Uh, you know, into another crisis between the North and the South or something different? Well, I think for um, advocates of the European project, um, the way in which everybody has instinctively reached for national government solutions um, is a deeply uncomfortable um, reminder to them that Europe is, um, uh, Europe is a successful association of nation states. It isn't um, a super state. I don't honestly think there's an existential threat to the European Union, but I do think there's a very big challenge to the Eurozone and the single currency, because at the heart of the single currency is this um, conundrum that history tells us you can't have a single currency without a single political entity devising a single fiscal um, strategy that um, operates across the whole of the single currency zone. And we've had crises before that have brought this, um, this challenge into sharp um, uh, contrast, and the European, the Eurozone has fudged them and moved on. Um, but this crisis has, has done so again. Um, it has brought into very sharp focus the question, what is the single currency all about? It was supposed to be a tool for um, uh, bringing the European uh, economies, the 19 economies, closer together, a tool for convergence. Um, and yet without um, shared fiscal risk um, in the form, for example, of corona bonds, it's difficult to see how um, that uh, convergence is being delivered. And I think that's a very big challenge for the Eurozone. Thank you, Philip. I'm going to try and, as I've been looking at the Q&A, some things have jumped to the top, which we haven't uh, quite got to, and I want to make sure uh, we touch the bus. So I've got three closing questions in three minutes, so you've got a, a minute each. We'll see how, how your parliamentary experience works on these. 
Um, number one, you know, there was some lack of clarity for our audience here about what you meant about the prospects for dealing with climate change at the end of this. Do you think governments will be able to put less effort into climate change uh, 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 efforts or more? Um, because in a way they have to provide that stability and certainty and there may be a public demand for it having lived with, with cleaner air and cleaner water, etc. What's your take first on, on climate? And I've got two more questions after that. Uh, so I think it's an open question. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, some people will take from this crisis that we can cut our carbon footprint, we can reduce our economic activity. Um, others will take a different lesson that post the crisis we need to rebuild our economies very quickly. I don't think the, the advanced Western economies in Europe, for example, are going to change their, their trajectory. The, the speed may temporarily adjust. But the big question for me is with oil and gas prices very low, um, are we going to um, maintain the, all, can I say, always slightly lukewarm enthusiasm of the emerging markets for embracing uh, the energy transition? Um, are they going to move away from coal? Are they perhaps going to go for gas rather than renewables as an interim? which is, the, I think, probably the nightmare scenario for those who are completely committed to the decarbonisation agenda. But a big economic shock, which causes people to recalibrate their priorities, must raise the question of which governments will remain fully committed to this agenda. This brings me to, to the a very important question. Here we are with SDGs. You talked yourself about the risk to developing countries suddenly people will be looking at the 0.7% in the UK. What's your sense of the prospects for uh, the impact on, on emerging markets of commitments to the SDGs, commitments to FDI into those countries? Uh, well, the emerging markets have, of course, been reminded very um, brutally how exposed they are um, to capital flows. And uh, I'm sure we'll be looking for greater resilience in the global safety net structure to try and protect them at an earlier stage because it happens so quickly um, that even though IMF, for example, has now responded um, to, to the challenges they're facing, already for many of them, very significant damage um, will have been done. I, I don't honestly think there's any real prospect that the UK will move away from its 0.7% uh, commitment. The fact that it's enshrined in law makes that all too difficult. If it was just a political decision from year to year, it might have been a different question. So last question for you, and maybe the way to do it quickly, because we're bang on seven o'clock, is to do it the following way. Uh, if you had to rank uh, between most powerful to least powerful in, let's say, four or five years' time, as this crisis has filtered its way through, one hopes, um, G20, US, China. Which would you put as the most powerful and which would you put as the least powerful in that process at the end of this crisis? Well, I mean, G20 isn't, isn't a player in the way that um, China and the US are as strategic I'm to use powers. it as a, as a shorthand for cooperation. Uh, but, but, oh, you know what yeah, I mean. But, uh, but, I, but I do think there's a huge challenge. If, if, if G20 is a shorthand for the um, uh, international system, the, uh, the currently recognized pattern of international collaboration. Um, I, I, I think it was always um, difficult for the international structures to spin up very quickly in a crisis like this, but where they will really come into their own is in the recovery phase. And I think that will be the big challenge. If G20 and the Bretton Woods institutions cannot demonstrate that they are up to the challenge of coordinating, managing and supporting the recovery, then that will be um, a, a very big um, problem for them. As to China and the US, um, look, I think we've got a long-term um, trend here. The Chinese economy is, uh, is closing on the US uh, economy in terms of size, whether it will actually get there, whether it will um, overtake the US economy before China's own demographic problems um, become a challenge for it in sustaining economic growth. I can't um, predict at the moment, but I think um, that is the big strategic 
um, debate, the, the big strategic standoff uh, that will dominate the recovery phase and indeed the next 10, 20, 30 years of our history. Philip, really, I can't believe we got through as many questions as we did um, and to other interventions, and we ranged very far and very wide. Um, but again, reflecting the many positions you've held in government, and of course, I'm sure a, a sharp eye to your own time in business as well. So you bring that extra uh, dimension to this. It's been a really fascinating conversation. We've held over 300 participants, 300 plus, you know, all the way to the end, um, which I think is a reflection of how insightful people found your comments. Thank you very much indeed for making the time to, to put yourself through that uh, process of, of questioning and sharing of ideas. I think on behalf of all of our members uh, and those guests who joined it, um, thank you very much. And thank you to all of our members for being with us uh, this evening and for the quick change in time, which meant you could uh, uh, join the five o'clock government announcement. I think we're going to try to avoid that timing in the future and stick with this kind of later in the evening time, which I think suits probably our speakers better as well. If we could only unmute everyone and applaud, we would do that. I'm going to applaud, and maybe my colleagues Ludi and Robin and, and Aaron might, uh, might unmute. But, um, Philip, thank you very much. We'll keep in touch. And uh, to all of our members, we hope to see you again soon. But thank you very much indeed for your time. Goodbye. Keep safe. Keep healthy. We hope to see you in St. James's Square again before too long. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.